Jerry, thank you very much indeed. First of all, may I say how pleased I am to be here. I'm not quite sure why I'm here. I'm still trying to find out why you invited me, but I'm, I'm very oh. Oh. <laughs> Yes, but I still, I, that still doesn't explain why you chose me. But I'm absolutely de delighted. Uh, I know a little bit about Rotary. My stepfather was a Rotarian in the West Country. And he always used to tell a story, you've probably heard it, about a mother who took her little boy to the zoo. And when they got to the lion's cage, the little boy said to his mother, Mummy, how do lions make love? And his mother said, I don't know, darling, your father's a Rotarian. We'll have to remember that one. <laughs> um, I've been asked to tell you a little bit about the organization of which I'm the Director General. And that organization is the Royal Overseas League. It's very unique in that uh, we are one of the few organizations of its type that has a Royal Charter. Now the Royal Overseas League is a self-funded organisation, it's a mutual society, which means that it's owned by its members. And I'll tell you more about the membership, but we have over 21,000 members throughout, throughout the world. Um, primarily Commonwealth, uh, although we now accept members from anywhere in the world as associates, uh, only Commonwealth people can be full members, meaning they have uh, uh, voting rights. Now, as I say, we're a mutual society, uh, we're incorporated by Royal Charter, and we're non-profit making. The Queen is our patron, and Princess Alexandra is our vice patron. And in fact, uh, we've had all the monarchs since we were founded as our patrons. The League was founded in 1910, by a visionary called Evelyn Wrench. He was inspired by Cecil Rhodes. His intentions initially were to further the aims of empire. That, over the years, evolved into furthering the ideals and aims of Commonwealth. Now, Evelyn Wrench enlisted the support of Lord Northcliffe of the uh, Daily Mail. I, I rather think they were taking advantage of each other. Northcliffe wanted to increase the circulation of what was called then the overseas Daily Mail. And Evelyn Wrench was keen to promote membership of the Royal Overseas League. So Northcliffe <coughs> got involved and helped raise lots of money. And he was in those days known as the founder of the League, but that was purely for financial reasons. I think our founder, Evelyn Wrench, was keeping Northcliffe sweet to get as much money out of him as he possibly could. <coughs> Certainly, um, Northcliffe helped promote membership, <coughs> and there's no question that the Royal Overseas League helped promote the sales of his newspaper. So I think the benefits were mutual, and the benefits were mutually enjoyed. Northcliffe was responsible for helping to raise the money to buy the Royal Overseas League's premises. And we have two absolutely stunning premises. One in London, just off St. James's Street, at the end of a cul-de-sac called Park Place, which overlooks Green Park. Uh, they are two very historic buildings and contain all our clubhouse facilities, which I always describe as being five-star at a two-star prices. <coughs> Not all the members would agree with me on that, but never mind. Um, we also have a wonderful premises in Edinburgh. Uh, again, the funds for that were raised jointly, I suppose, between our founder, Evelyn Wrench, and Northwood. Now, Evelyn Wrench's ideals, then, were to promote friendship amongst people of the then empire. Now it was very visionary because he wanted to create friendship between all peoples of the Commonwealth, not just the Anglo-Saxons, but people of every race, colour and creed. 
And of course, that is one of the ideals of the Commonwealth, and it's an ideal which we continue to support and that we continue to further. The other visionary aspect of Evelyn Wrench was that he wanted the League, the Royal Overseas League's membership, to include women. And women have been entitled to membership of the Royal Overseas League since it was founded in 1910. Now that was eight years before suffrage, and it was actually 18 years before full suffrage. I mean, women didn't get the full vote until 1928. So it was pretty visionary for uh, our founder to have uh, given women membership on equal status to men in 1910. And we were talking about it at lunch here. There are still many clubs in London who don't accept women at all. Yeah. Well, not just one. Jolly <laughs> cool. <laughs> <laughs> and here we were discussing at lunch how the egalitarian between the nationals are coming. And then you go, you go and spoil it by the first year. Anyway, don't mind. There is one particular club in London which will be named this. Um, it's called Wipes. <laughs> it won't even let a woman across the threshold. And if I may just digress, Mr. Brethren, at the moment. Uh, there was a famous story when they, uh, their, their chairman came to see me some years ago to ask if he might approach our interior designer. And her name is Rosemary Hamilton. And I said, by all means. He said, well, we like, what, we like your interior design, so we think she can, she can look after whites for us. And I said, well, go ahead. And I saw Rosemary some uh, time later, and I said, how, how did it go with whites? And she said, oh, it was no problem. We agreed a retainer. Everything was fine until I received the confirmation letter. And at the bottom of the letter in small print it said, we must remind you that we are a strictly a gentleman's club. You may only enter the club before 9 a.m. or after 11 p.m. Needless <laughs> <laughs> to say, uh, she told them what they could do with their uh, matter. Um, let me tell you a little bit about our, our wonderful premises uh, in both London and Edinburgh. The clubhouses in London, um, they are uh, two houses, both built in, nine, in 1735. The most historic is what we call Rutland House. Our founder bought it from the Dukes of Rutland um, in the 20s. Our other house was the home of Admiral Vernon. We call that <coughs> Vernon House. As I say, both very historic, both grade one, all grade one listed. They have been extended in the 30s, before there was uh, all the problem of planning permission, thank goodness, because we have a lot of bedrooms there. Uh, the buildings now contain 80 first class bedrooms, all air conditioned, private bathroom facilities, and uh, five star facilities, two star prices, and wonderful catering facilities, and so forth. And uh, in our Rutland house, um, the grand old Duke of York, who had 10,000 men, died in 1927. He actually died in what is now our bar. In those days, of course, it, it was his, uh, his, his apartment. And what happened was, he, had, uh, he was the brother of, of George IV, son of George III. Uh, George IV was childless. Um, he was very keen that, that his brother, George III, should go out and meet a nice woman, get married and have children, so they would be the heirs to the throne, to stop the other brother, the Duke of Kent, getting to the throne. Now, instead of going out and meeting some nice unmarried society woman, he decided to have a, a very notorious affair with the Duchess of Rutland. And uh, it was a bit of a scandal all over London, um, but it seems that uh, the Duke of Rutland was quite happy to allow this. I suppose it's a bit like um, uh, that Parker Bowles chap. <laughs> <laughs> he was perfectly happy. Not bad, really, you know, get you in with the future king and all that. Sort of thing. <laughs> so he, he seemed to have tolerated it. And uh, anyway, the, the Duchess died. And the poor old Duke was absolutely heartbroken, took off to Brighton to stay at the pavilion, got the palsy. And the very man that he'd been cuckolding, the Duke of Rutland, invited him to come and recuperate at what is now our building, Rutland House in Park Place, London. 
and he had the apartment which is now our cocktail bar <laughs> and uh, a few months after moving in as a guest of the man he'd been cuckolding he dies you won't need to know that you can't be done for libel when somebody's dead. So you're right. <laughs> <laughs> and my son is dead. And anyway, Porchat died in in our house with the sound of his palace being built down the road. And what is now Lancaster House? Which, which is, of course, the famous place where so many colonies got their independence at, at conferences, and not least Kendra in 1963. Uh, Lancaster House was actually originally called York House, and it was being built for Frederick, Duke of York, uh, the Grand Old Duke of York, as his palace. And when he died, it was only half built. Uh, apparently, people were beating down the doors. His creditors were beating down the doors because he owed so much money. And they built a... They built a, um, a statue to him uh, on Carlton Terrace. It's still there. And it was one of the first statues to have a, a lightning conductor on it. But the word around town was that it was for his creditors to file their unpaid bills. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, we have commemorated it now. We have a plaque in the barn commemorating him. And we also were very fortunate to get a print of a portrait which was in the Queen's Gallery. They've just recently given us a, a copy of the uh, portrait, a print of it, to, to put above the plaque in the cocktail bar. Um, right, so those are the premises in London. Uh, as I say, very, very uh, historic. The architect was James Gibb, who also was the architect of Mary the Strand and St. Martin's in the field. And in <coughs> The early 30s, our founder, with money, Northcliffe told to raise, bought our, our wonderful premises in Edinburgh, yeah, well, which are 100 Princess yeah, Street, directly yeah, opposite and yeah. with unrestricted views of sure, Edinburgh Castle. Yeah, and we have only we, we have 80, 80 rooms in London, and we have uh, 17 in Edinburgh. Now, I must move on a bit more quickly, because I'm sure we're running out of time. But, um, <coughs> The membership, as I said, is 20, just over 20 months now. <coughs> it's almost equally divided between men and women, and almost equally divided between UK membership and overseas membership. We're very strong in the old dominions, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and so forth. We're getting stronger now in <coughs> Europe, and uh, we're getting stronger also in some of the new Commonwealth countries. Less so, I have to say, in Africa. I mean, there's an awful lot of Commonwealth countries in Africa. They're, sadly, most of them are having, I think, one or two very rare exceptions. Most of the African countries are struggling and having all sorts of difficulties, which is frightfully sad, including my old home of Kenya, and uh, it's, it's very sad to see. But uh, elsewhere in the new Commonwealth, we're doing quite well. And now, as I said earlier, we are accepting non-Commonwealth citizens as associate members, the only difference being they can't vote as an AGM, and I'm sure they're not too bothered about that. Now, 21,000 members, we need a big market for 80 bedrooms. I, I always say I just hope they don't all come at once. Um, <laughs> now, the Royal Overseas League, what does it do? Okay, we continue to help foster the ideal of economy. We continue to foster friendship and understanding amongst Commonwealth people of all races and colors and creeds. And we do that by offering them hospitality, by having branches throughout the world. We have, we have 19 branches overseas. We have 10 branches in the UK. They don't all have premises, I have to say. Some of them have offices, but they use other people's premises. We have 85 reciprocal clubs around the world where our members can meet and meet <coughs> others. We have 15, for example, in India, some of the finest clubs. Their members can use our facilities, our members can use their facilities. A lot of members join simply for the use of the reciprocal clubs. Okay. But we do also good works. We use our money, not for selfish reasons, but to, to, to do good works. Yeah. We promote the careers of young Commonwealth classical musicians through staging a, 
uh, an annual music competition. We have overseas scholarships. We spend a lot of money bringing overseas musicians to London for further studies. We run a, a, an art competition, again, for Commonwealth, young Commonwealth artists. Again, scholarships all around the world, bringing artists to London for workshops and exhibitions and so forth. And also, we are major supporters of the, um, of the competition, which is called uh, uh, Young African Writers. And that's um, run by Emma Nicholson, the widow of um, Sir Michael Kay, of, of Booker's fame. So art, music, and literature. And we also support a humanitarian welfare project in Namibia. And I noticed in your annual review, President, that you're supporting something similar in Kenya. But we are applying a lot of money into Namibia to provide education to the children of the San Bushmen in the northern part of, uh, of Namibia. You may have seen programs and read about the San Bushmen. They're very marginalized. They're persecuted all over uh, central and southern uh, Africa. And we've already now got some of those that we supported in primary school. Some of those are now teachers, thanks to the money the Royal Overseas League, well, it's the Royal Overseas League members have provided for these young people. Um, I heard you saying uh, earlier, uh, somebody was saying something about computers, and I heard some of you say you didn't uh, have uh, computers. I just wanted to read you this, if I may, about computers. And it's called, What Gender is a Computer? A language instructor was explaining to her adult class that French nouns, unlike their English counterparts, are grammatically designated as masculine or feminine. Things like chalk or pencil, she described, would have a gender association, although these words are neutral in English. Puzzled, one student asked, what gender is a computer? The instructor wasn't sure, so she divided the class into male and female groups to decide if a computer should be masculine or feminine. Both groups were asked to give four reasons for their recommendation. The group of women, the group of women concluded that computers should be referred to in the masculine <coughs> because, one, in order to get their attention, you have to turn them on. <laughs> Two, they have a lot of data but are still clueless. <laughs> Three, they are supposed to help you solve your problems, but half the time they are the problem. <laughs> does this ring true with anybody? <laughs> Has anybody ordered a cat? No. no. Cat? no. Cat? 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 Uh, four, as soon as you commit to one, you realize that if you had waited a little longer, you might have found a better model. <laughs> the men, on the other hand, decided that computers should be referred to in the feminine gender because no one but their creator understood their internal logic. <laughs> Two, your smallest mistakes are stored in long-term memory for later retrieval. <laughs> that certainly rings true with me. Three, the native language they use to communicate, communicate with other computers is incomprehensible <coughs> to everyone else. Four, as soon as you make a commitment to one, you find yourself spending half your paycheck on accessories for it. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, Chairman, there's just one other little story I wanted to tell you, um, and that is that I do uh, a lot of work on publicity for the Royal Overseas League, and I travel a lot for the Royal Overseas League, and I'm always getting caught out by the press. Um, I got caught out in Australia one time, but it was crit critical of uh, Keating when he was Prime Minister of Australia. I said something about his, his, his problem. His Irishness, and I was quoted in all practical <laughs> And um, it reminded me of, of, of the story of the, of the Caribbean Archbishop who uh, went to New York on a, on a visit, and he was met when he landed in New York by the press. And the uh, first thing the press asked him on arrival was, 
what do you think about the brothels in New York? And he replied, are there any brothels in New York? <laughs> and the following morning, the headline in the papers were, <laughs> Archbishop's first <laughs> remarks on arrival. <laughs> <laughs> I brought along some of the Royal Overseas League magazines. We produce a quarterly magazine. It's a magazine of real quality. It goes to our 21,000 members around the world free of charge. It contains articles of interest, particularly uh, by uh, members, of course. It also <coughs> contains a list of all the activities we do. We do a lot of events for members, discussion groups and all sorts of things like that. Uh, we, we run a lot of art, music, and literary events, and they're all listed in here. I'd like to, to leave these here for you, if I may. I think you'll find it very interesting. And I've also bought a whole load of uh, brochures, which tell you all about our, our fabulous clubhouses. And I have to tell you, the clubhouse in London, I think it's probably got the best location of any hotel or club or anything in London. We have no passing traffic. We're at the end of a cul-de-sac. We overlook Green Park, so no passing traffic anywhere. We have our own garden where we do our fresco dining in the summer. And the great thing about the Royal Overseas League is that I always describe the membership as being exclusive but not elitist. We have members from every walk of life, which makes it very special. Sheep shearers from the outback of Australia <laughs> to peers of the realm. And our membership subscription fees are very modest compared to other London clubs. A, a London member with a 50 mile radius only pays something like £240 a year. Uh, overseas memberships, I think, £100. So it's very reasonable. And you only have to stay uh, for one, one or two nights in London or a couple of nights in Edinburgh and you pay for your membership. So I'm going to leave these, which include membership application forms. Uh, which you might like to distribute either today or sometime, and these magazines. Um, have I... Yes, that's fine. Is that about that's time fine. now? Take if you have any questions, yes. I'd be very happy yes, to take them. Questions. Questions. Well, anything to do with the Commonwealth, uh, or the clubs themselves, or the, the association. Yes. Yes. Or brothels. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> in their individual areas if we need them. If we're going somewhere, we're doing a concert, they will help us. They're very good. We like them. Yes, you good are. Outfit. Yes. You have been operating since 1910. Yes. But why are you not only 21 colored members? <laughs> good question. Back, I mean, the, the, I suppose the most successful era for the league was the 30s and possibly the 50s when the membership did go up to just over 50,000. But uh, these days, I think 21,000 is pretty good. And as I say, that there's no association <coughs> of, of our type that has anywhere near the, the, the membership we have. We've done very well. So, uh, yes, I, I don't think actually it would be a good thing to increase it, because if we did, I don't think we could satisfy the demand of more than 21,000 members. As it is, there are, there are occasions when our premises in London is fully, uh, uh, when the bedrooms are fully booked, and members become aggrieved. And they can't <laughs> get a room just when they want to. Sorry? Why do you bring all the membership forms to London? Why did you have to ask that question? <laughs> yes, you, if you wanted to. No, I, I don't have enough Rotarians, there's the answer. Oh. Oh. And, and in Upminster, you're not like, likely to use the bedrooms. Sorry. <laughs> Are the clubs you are associated with, does that include the arts club in Dover Street? No. I, we do offer the arts club, I think, we offer them um, hospitality during their closure periods. I think they're probably closed for Christmas and maybe they're closed in the summer. Yes, we do that for a lot of London. We, we never close. We like the Windmill Theatre. We're open 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. Yeah, that's probably a reason because they have an interest in the club. Um, I'm a member of the arts club and I'm wondering if that really should be. What's the qualification for looking at the 